Okay, um, thank you for the introduction, Lindsay. Um, so now you all know that um, before I had children, I went into the field of applied behavior analysis and took the coursework and I am a board certified behavior analyst. So you might think that this puts me at like a huge advantage over you and I just have a little disclaimer. It's way easier for me to give you advice or to clean up anyone else's mess than it is to clean up my mess at home, okay? <laughs> it's very hard to be consistent and follow this all the time at home and that's part of the thing about it. I think a lot of people would rather have an easier way to do this. You know, have a magic pill that's going to work versus using behavioral techniques which are intensive. They require consistency and you have to do it all the time in order for it to be effective. If you just do it a little bit here and there, it's not going to work. And so it's, it's like a commitment if you're going to go with this um, methodology. So first, um, applied behavior analysis. What is it? Behavior analysis focuses on the principles that explain how learning takes place. So that's the basic, you know, if anyone took psychology classes and you remember the name B.F. Skinner, he was one of the grandfathers of behavior analysis, if you will. Um, so ABA is the use of these techniques and principles to bring about meaningful and positive change in behavior. And I say meaningful because it's really an individualized science where you're focusing on an individual, not a large group of people in the way that many of the other sciences focus. Um, and the way we do this is we reward behavior that we like and you want to keep increasing that behavior so you will reward it. And on the same token, you have to be careful which behavior you reinforce because if you're you know, at the grocery store and your child wants a lollipop and they fall to the floor crying, like, okay, okay, I'll get the lollipop, whatever, just to get you to stop crying, guess what you just reinforced? The falling to the floor. So it's hard. You know, if your child does that, you have to say, no, I'm sorry, that's not the behavior that's going to get you a lollipop. You need to stand up and ask me nicely. And if it's that, that's with a sign or a picture or pointing or a word, However your child communicates, that's how they have to ask you nicely for something, not falling to the floor to get it. So these are things that might seem in some ways like common sense, but as a parent in public, that all goes out the window and you just want your child not to have like a tantrum in front of everybody and you know, you just wanna go in and go out unnoticed and you know, <laughs> all those things that don't happen anymore for us, right? So, Ivar Lovas was, um, he is a doctor, professor at UCLA, and he was a pioneer in ABA. And he actually was the first to prove that um, you can modify children's behavior through teaching. And he focused on children with autism. So this is something that is huge in the world of autism. And for that reason, if you suspect that your child has any autistic tendencies, I would highly encourage you to get them evaluated for autism because it will open up the doors. ABA is a very expensive treatment and school districts and insurance companies do not want to pay for it if they don't have to. So if you get an autism diagnosis, don't look at it as like, oh no, it's another label on my child. Try to get that thinking out of your head and think of it instead as this is positive because now we can fight for ABA and it's documented. There are over 40 years of research to document that ABA is an effective treatment of autism. Now what they don't say is it's an effective treatment for any child. I mean, a typical child you can use ABA to teach them. And you know, lots of people do. They do sticker charts when they're toilet training. That's using ABA. Um, they'll tell them you can have dessert after dinner. That's ABA. So we all may use some of these in our daily lives anyway without thinking about it. But if you actually have a diagnosis of autism, that's when you can fight your school district and fight your insurance company to have them pay for the ABA because it's very expensive. And as a parent, I don't know, it, it's like nearly impossible to be able to afford this on your own. You really need them to help. So I would encourage you if you suspect that your child meets the criteria for autism that you go ahead and fight to get that diagnosis. So as I said, there are decades of research to back up ABA and um, I really, really would encourage you to at least give it a try with your children. Peter, initially my son, was in our regular pre, um, preschool program in our district. It was a special needs preschool, but they didn't use ABA. It was just um, like a language-based preschool. And he learned a lot, 
But what I started realizing is that they could not control his behaviors. And, you know, Peter has, um, he was the one who had the little subway skit on the opening night in case you're trying to put a, a face to a name. He has a lot of language and, you know, a lot of social interest in things, but his behaviors are off the charts, okay? The irony is not lost on me, right, that he's mine. So it's, it's like this constant struggle of me at home, like, okay, behaviorist, what do I need to do versus, I'm trying to do the dishes, will you please go sit down? I mean, so like I said, I am right there with you guys. Like it's, it's a struggle because I know what I should be doing and then it's often not possible for me to like manage that at home all the time. But at least if you're in a behavioral program, they can help you at school as well and it won't all be on you. So eventually, um, he wasn't making the progress that I knew he was capable of. Because he had the autism diagnosis, the school gave me zero problems about removing him from their district program and putting him into a school for children with autism. And you know, he still has behaviors, don't get me wrong, but they're addressing it at that school. Um, in the regular school, I got calls every day, you're gonna need to come get him. And I'm like, are you kidding? He's having a behavior and I come get him? Do you know what that's teaching him? You're reinforcing his behavior. Where do you think he wants to go? He wants to come home. And you know, I don't get calls like that anymore at his school. They deal with it and then they'll write me a note to let me know how his day was, but I don't have to come pick him up early because he's you know, having a meltdown. So it's just something to kind of think about. Um, one of my favorite things to talk about is language. I love teaching children language. I actually taught preschool students with autism, and so of course at the age of like three to five, that's when you're really focusing on language. And so for those of you whose kids are not yet talking or who you really feel like they're struggling in that area, I would encourage you to look at language the way that B.F. Skinner categorized it. And he made up his own names for it because he wanted it to be different from what other people were working on at the time. So he used the word manned, and I'm just throwing this word out there so that if you hear it in the school district or somewhere that you've heard it before, and a manned is basically, think of it as demand, or it's a request. Then you have tact, which he used as making contact with your environment. It's essentially labeling something. The next word is echoic, and that would be repeating what someone else says to you. And then introverbal, and that's essentially having a conversation, a back and forth conversation with someone. So the first type of language that you want to teach your child is a manned because that directly affects them. So if they want a cookie and you teach them how to ask for cookie, they get a cookie and they realize this language thing is great. I say cookie, I get a cookie. Okay, I like that. I say mommy, mommy picks me up. I like that. You know, I say stop and they stop singing, you know, whatever it is. Okay, so that's teaching them this is how I communicate. And, and it doesn't have to be spoken words. I actually taught PD to speak with sign language. And you can see he doesn't stop talking now. Now that does, you know, it really helped him because he learned, he couldn't get the words out initially, but he started learning that, you know, this is a sign I think for music, something like this. And he couldn't do that sign at the time. And so he used to go like this, but we learned what it meant. He loved music. And so he learned how to man for music and when he did that, he got music. And he started to realize like, oh, okay, so, you know, and the, don't teach your children more, just as a quick, because they'll come up to you and say more. It could be something they're referring to an hour ago. And you're gonna think more, more what? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. So if you give them that one first, they're gonna use that one and all the time. And, and you're not gonna have any idea what they're talking about. So you wanna teach specific things, eat, drink, ball, bubbles, things that, you know, music, mom, things that they want the most, that's what you're going to focus on first because you want them to understand that language is beneficial to them and that it's relevant to them. And later you start working on some of the other ones. Um, if they can't ever learn to repeat after you, they're not ever going to be able to learn language. So you think about with a typical child, you say mama, dada over and over and you want them to repeat it. That's important too. But really the first part of language you want to teach is the mand or the request because that helps them understand that language benefits them and that there's a reason for them to use language. Um, you also want to use what they call establishing operations and that's a fancy term for their motivation. And this is fun because you can actually manipulate this. So an example I would give you if you want to teach your child to ask for a drink, give them something salty because it will make them thirsty. 
So that's going to increase your learning opportunities. So you feed them the salty potato chips, and then you sit there and drink water in front of them. And then they might start reaching for it. And you say, oh, water. I'm drinking water. Do you want some water? And you know, if they cannot speak, that's OK. You teach them the sign. right? And you can make up your own signs. You don't have to follow the American Sign Language. You can do your own. But that's how you would teach them, where you say, what, water? And you know, slowly, every single time. So you always, it was hard when Petey was really young, because I felt like I always had to be on. You know, and I was always trying to come up with ways to teach him different things and to limit, like I wouldn't ever allow him to have access to the remote control because I wanted him to get that stuff through me. I wouldn't ever put any snacks down low because I wanted him to get that through me. Everything had to be through me. He had to see me as the gateway for anything he wants. You know, I put the bubbles in reach, I mean, excuse me, in sight, but out of reach. His games, his Elmo, everything up high, and you know, the, the danger here is that he would try sometimes to like climb up and get it on his own because he's resourceful like that. But you want them to see you as the person who can access things for them and who will get them all the good things. You know, you want to be seen, you want to what they call pair yourself with reinforcement. You want them to see you as the means to getting what they want in life. Um, another thing, you know, I would say if I think I gave this example um, last time, but if you ask me if like a pencil is something that I find reinforcing, I would say no. But I was lost one time and I, this was before like the fancy cell phones and so I stopped and I called Eric to ask him like for directions to get me out of, I told him where I was and you know he looked it up on the computer when we used to use MapQuest, remember that? And so he went on MapQuest and he was telling me like how I needed to get out of there, well I didn't have a pen. And I was like, what I wouldn't do for like a pencil right now, right? Like normally if you're like, hey, what are you going to do for this pencil? I'd be like, nothing. But in that moment, I was desperate for a pencil. So think of that example and how you can alter your environment to make things reinforcing for your child, to teach them how to ask for it. Because the more learning opportunities that you present them with, the more practice they're going to get in requesting things and the more they're going to start to associate language, either verbal language, sign language, picture communication language, with getting what they want. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, so if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them about that. And so, but backtracking a little, so with, with language, when children don't have language, that's when you're going to see an increase in inappropriate behaviors. Because children are going to do, or, or adults, um, whatever's worked in the past. So if in the past, falling on the floor to get the lollipop at the store worked, what do you think they're going to continue to do? Fall on the floor. So initially, it might be really tricky if in the past you've reinforced behaviors that are negative. It might be tricky to get them to stop those behaviors. But what you want to do is, you want to be more proactive instead of reactive about it. And so before you go into the store, before you can even see the lollipops, you want to go over, OK, look, Petey, here's the deal. If you want a lollipop, you have to ask me for one. If you fall on the floor, no lollipop. And I'm not above leaving my cart and picking my child up and leaving the store. And you have to be willing to do that. It sucks. You know, um, there's no two ways around it. But if they think that they have the upper hand, which, again, we all want to avoid like a public meltdown and, and people staring at us. And, you know, it's hard. And I'll get embarrassed, you know, and turn red. I, you all saw that the other night. Um, but the thing is, you have to work through it, and you have to be willing to say, like, no, this is, I'm the boss. You're not getting the lollipop because you fell down. You're going to ask for it, or you're not going to get it. And, and they, you know, initially when they're learning to ask for things, you kind of want to reinforce it every single time so that they learn that connection. Once they've got it down pat, that's when you start saying, like, okay, well, no, it's only 9 o'clock. You're not having a lollipop now. You know, that comes later. Once they're learning language, you want to reinforce every opportunity so that they learn when I speak, I get good things. You really want to pair that together. Um, OK, any questions? Any, any language questions? Any behavior questions? Yes? Yes. Because everything you just said, we're going through. Um, we call it the terrible two phases. Right. Everyone goes through the terrible twos, but there's like a, an extra layer of fun, right? But she has that extra strength. Right. She's doing this thing when she just falls off this stuff. She'll just go. <clears throat> but it's like she's two. Right. But then it's like, like I know you guys probably see me all around here. Like, sorry, I probably 
apologize. Just like I said to you earlier, I know she's in the meetings. I apologize. I don't know how to like. Well, I hear you, and and you want to think about it from her perspective. She has no way to communicate to you right now. So she's so frustrated that her little body, when she gets frustrated, that's all she can do is bang and let you know, I'm mad. So then it's up to you to run around like and try to figure out why is she frustrated, like what's wrong. So if you know what's wrong, because sometimes you know, you want to give her that language and give her the words or however you're teaching her. So if you're using picture communication system, if you're using sign and you know that, you know, um, she wants to watch Elmo on TV, but like right now you're watching the news. You can say, oh, you know, you want Elmo? Elmo. And you want to show her, you know, Elmo and say, okay, Elmo's later. And, you know, you want to give her a way to communicate to you because if she has no way to communicate, you're going to see behaviors. That's guaranteed. So she needs a way to communicate to you. And that has to be the big focus right now. Is she in early intervention? Yes. Okay. So you want to work on having like the speech therapist and the occupational therapist, everybody work on her using some form of communication to get what she wants. And um, you know, like bubbles, I think this was the sign that we taught him for bubbles. Most kids can probably manage something similar to that. So you want to teach them. I, I thought signs were really easy because I didn't have to worry about carrying like the picture communication system with me wherever we went. You know, it was just his hands. He just had to use his hands. And again, his fine motor skills were not great. So every sign was a modification of like the true ASL sign. But it worked for us. And like I said, you heard him talking. He got that connection between I say bubbles, mommy blows bubbles. I say eat, mommy gives me food. I say drink, she gives me a drink. And, you know, I say no. And, and she's respecting no, I don't want to go. And I'd say, okay, you know, you said no, you have one minute, and then it's time for us to go. Or, you know, to, because you still ha they still have to have limits, but you just want to teach them the importance of their words or their, you know, their signs to get points across to you rather than having an outburst or, you know, but it's still going to happen. I mean, Petey's been having tantrums still. You know, he's 10 years old, it still happens, and I remind him that you know you have words and you have to use them it's easier maybe just to scream or to hit somebody or to kick but you have to use your words that's when we're going to answer you that's when we're going to respond to you and that's when you're going to get what you want when you use the words okay keep going it's hard but we can do this you're welcome yes more frustrated lately and he'll sometimes he'll like hit me, slap me in the face, pull my hair, grab my neck. His therapist say to just ignore it for now if that's the best thing. And then also what he started doing did it twice the other day, he'll like hit himself now. So yeah. I want to stop that. I don't want that to become like a new habit. Yep. Ignoring is so hard. But it's definitely the right way to go. If you're not sure why a child is engaging in a behavior, ignoring and when I say ignoring, I don't necessarily mean like walking away and letting them hurt themselves. But you don't want to say, oh, don't hit your head, because then the, it may have started as a behavior where they were frustrated, so they hit their head. But if you're now having this huge reaction, they're going to continue to engage in that behavior, very likely because they saw that reaction from you. And another thing we're, as parents, guilty of is we tend to give big reactions when we're yelling or angry, and maybe not such big reactions when we're praising them. Like, be like, oh, nice job. You're sitting so nicely. That's not really reinforcing, right? Like you want to be like, oh my gosh. You know, it, it, you feel like maybe silly doing it, but think about how you act when you yell at someone. You want to give them that same level of intensity and like facial expression and everything because if they realize that like the yelling evokes one behavior from you and like doing like sitting nicely only invokes like a high five, what do you think they're going to want, right? So think about that. Um, but definitely with the hitting of themselves, that's usually, again, a frustration, too, about an inability to tell you something. So you want to just put their hands down and try to figure out what's going on in the moment and say, okay, you know, I know you're frustrated. You want to, like, try to talk them through it, but don't address the hitting. You don't want to actually talk about it. Just block it with your hands the best you can. And, you know, even if, if the two of you are there, if one of you comes from behind him and blocks it so he can't see you blocking it, and then the other one will talk to him about it. And 
it's really, if you know what's going on, you wanna just keep giving those words because even though he might not be able to output it, if you keep getting in there, he's hearing it over and over what he needs to say and, and what you're expecting from him. You. You're welcome. Yes. Um, so. We have Bob Barker <laughs> over here. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so with Martha, she's really very, very behind. So she's nearly two, but she really is like a baby. Right. And um, I guess I struggle with, I think we treat her like a baby, because she's like one. Of course. Um, but there are sort of moments where I become confused about what to do, because we're just sort of starting with some of these things. She's been going to sign classes since she, before she was one, but she doesn't really sign. Okay. So there's one example of one kind of paper where you hold her and she's grinning at you and then she starts hitting your head. And we were like, no, why are you hitting us? And then we realized, so the, in British Sign Language, mummy is that. Yes. But she doesn't, she can't hit her own head. She can't hit her own head. She can't right. That, or, or she can't she control. Yes, yeah, she, she, so she does hit <laughs> Right, she might not be able to control how hard she's hitting. So she's trying to do mommy, but she's doing it too hard. But Maybe. It's the fact that she does it to your head, so Instead of like, her own. She sees you do that. So she's, okay. She's like, oh, yes. Well, what you want to do is physically prompt her then to teach her. And I neglected to mention that before. When I taught PD Sign Language, I would take his hand and do it on his body instead of me doing it because I wanted him to feel what it felt like. And so for eat, like before every bite, I mean, I'm telling you, this was labor intensive, okay? I, that's why Richie is four and a half years younger because I was so stressed out when, you know, I was dealing with him that it was all I could do. You know, I couldn't like even think about another child. And so I would take his hand before every single bite and I would do eat and then I would give him a bite. And then I would do it again, eat, and then I would give him a bite and over and over and over again. And then he started to get it. I mean, he didn't get it overnight. You know, it took time, but then he would do eat and then it would be good enough for me. Once he did eat, I would just feed him at that point when he was doing it independently. But when we were learning, you know, I would take his hands and, and fold them like this and do bubbles and then I would blow bubbles for him. And then if he wanted more, I would take his hands again in that moment. So it's very intense. I mean, this is not an easy way to teach a child language, but early on, and, and if you keep working on this with them, they're going to learn it. And then, like I said, it might be a modification. You might see something like this, but she'll get it. And then every time you see her do that, oh, you want bubbles? Okay, here are the bubbles, and you blow the bubbles. And you know, if she's hitting your head, and you say, oh, do you want mommy? And you take her hand and do it on her own head and say, this is how we ask mommy and then practice it again, mommy, and then you pick her up and give her a hug every time she does it so she learns that that's how she gets your attention. But yeah, it's hard if they start like pulling your hair because sometimes they might do it just because they like how it feels, like sensory-wise. You know, if you do this, like that might kind of feel nice between her fingers or, you know. Well, she thinks it's hysterical when oh, people go paddle. Yeah. And then she giggles, but the problem is her giggle is so lovely that you can't help. It's really hard to kind of go, oh, I must do that. I know, it is. It's definitely hard. And, you know, you can tell her, like, you know, that hurts mommy. Let's not do that. And maybe give her a replacement, like a doll, and say, here, you can pull this. If you want to pull hair, pull here. That's another thing that really works with behaviors. So in addition to providing them language, you want to give them a replacement. So you, I've seen some of the kids here with chewy tubes. Um, and if you don't know what that is, it's like a really hard, rubbery, plastic-like device that children can chew on. So a lot of times you'll see kids might chew on their shirts, they might chew on their hand, they might chew on their hair, they might chew on you. You don't want them to do that, so you give them something that can give them that same feeling, but not, it's not as inappropriate. So um, I would encourage you to do that if she's maybe looking for people to say ow. So maybe she doesn't care at all about the hair, but she likes hearing people say ow. You want to maybe encourage her to she wants to interact with people. That's what she's actually looking for. So you want to, you know, maybe teach her how to wave. And then people, instead of ah, would say hi. But if you teach, you know, um, some close family members to be really animated, because think when you say ah, you're like ow, and you make a face, right? She probably likes that whole package. And when people say hi, they might just say, oh, hi. But if you teach them to be more animated about it, to reinforce her wave, she's going to get that same, like, social in interest that she's after but in an appropriate way. So we just want to try to teach appropriate behaviors to replace the inappropriate behaviors. And so we ignore, we teach language, we teach replacement skills, all of that. It's hard, it's hard work.
but you can do it, Laura. <laughs> Any more questions? I actually have one. Okay. Um, my daughter's 11. She definitely has autistic type behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, you were mentioning with the chewy toys. Uh, she prefers like balls. She always goes back and forth between like balls, paper right. towels. A lot of the kids like to shred paper. Yes. From a behavior standpoint, she has always done really good with ABA type stuff. Okay. But there are some times where I feel there's autistic type behaviors, and what should you do with those as far as removing them and trying to do something else? So, what kind of behavior do you mean? Like. Well. For instance, like she, she loves paper towels. She, she goes back and forth, so it's not like sometimes she'll put them in her mouth, sometimes. She Got it. it. Okay. Here, this can be a little bit controversial. You know, some people feel in the field that you want to eliminate these behaviors altogether and that you should always, you know, discourage her, take it away from her. Um, I'm not really on that side. Um, we all engage in self-stimulatory behaviors. And so I won't ask for examples, but um, one example I will give you would be like if someone's on the desk going like this. It's not bothering, well, hopefully not bothering anyone, but that's just something you're doing to kind of keep yourself busy as you're paying attention, or you might like, you know, cross your leg and kind of move your leg. So our kids have that same need to have some self-stimulatory behaviors. And so I would encourage you to teach her an appropriate time and place and maybe allow for like you know a certain time of the day that she can do paper shredding as long as she's not eating it you know so that behavior i would work on decreasing and maybe if there's a food you can think of or like a some kind of wafer light wafery thing that might be similar to the texture of paper that you can give her and say oh you know i, I wouldn't even know um do you like how that tastes? Well, let's try this instead. And you can ask for wafer, you know, and you want to teach her to ask for wafer, but give her a time when she's allowed to rip paper. And you can, um, they have these really great clocks now that ha are, have like red on them. So it's like a white clock, and then you set it and you pull it down for say 15 minutes, and it's red, and the red will slowly get smaller to show her. So they don't need to be able to tell time, they just need to see that red getting smaller, and when the red's gone, your time's over. And PD does this actually. He likes to engage in um, talk about the subways where he will repeat the messages that they say on the subways and say, like, an A train is coming in two minutes, and you know, please watch the gap. And he loves, loves, loves to do that. And I do not love, love to hear that. <laughs> so um, we have a playroom in the basement. And I, I have a special chair down there, and I said, you know what? You can engage in subway talk when you want to, but you need to do it down there, not in the kitchen while I'm cooking, because I can't bear to hear it. So he goes down there, and he can engage in subway talk all he wants, because he should be able to engage in self-stimulatory behavior, but just in that context. And so, you know, I, he tried to start that when he had the microphone. He had this captive audience, and he was like ready to go, and I just reminded him that's not part of the deal. You're not doing that up here. That's private. That's what you do when you're in the basement. You can do subway talk. So it's, again, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. You're going to constantly need to address it when you see them engaging it in an in, appropriate place. Or you know, and this can apply to any behavior. It doesn't matter if it's you know pulling paper, having um, the the talk, any any behavior that it is. You want to teach them that it's okay to do it, but here in this controlled environment, not in public. Does that help? Absolutely. Okay. Good luck. Yes. So he uh, starts uh, to fight mm -hmm. some friends on the chair and hit. And she's hitting me on my face when she's angry. Okay. A lot of kids do that. How old is Sophia? Okay. Yeah, I feel like she's at an age where many children do that. Um, but when they're hitting and biting kids in daycare, that of course becomes a problem because the other parents, you know, are not happy with that. So I would say they need the daycare needs to be really on top of her specifically because she could be doing it because she likes watching the other kids cry. Like it's a big reaction when the other kids cry. Not that there's anything mean about her. I just mean that she, um, if you bite another child, they're gonna ow 
or they're, they're going to cry and it's a big reaction. So she might want to play with them, but she doesn't know how to engage with them. Um, she also could be at an age where she just needs that stimulation in her mouth. And so um, one of these chewy tubes maybe could work for her that she has something to bite on to give her that input that she needs. But they want to work on telling her, you know, no biting and removing her from that situation. And the same thing, no hitting. And you, you, you bring her when you show her how to do nice to her friends. I mean, one and a half is so little for them to really grasp all of this. It's, um, I don't even know at what age kids are really understanding typically, let alone with a disability, when they are not allowed to do that anymore. But it's just, it's a constant struggle and you're gonna have to keep practicing with her and that, you know, no biting and remove her from the fun. You know, if they're playing um, in, in the kitchen area or they're playing in the blocks and she hits, then she has to be removed from that area. No fun for one minute, you know, and then you go back and, and you want to show her and practice, this is nice, this is how we play with our friends and, you know, we don't bite our friends and it's, it's just going to be a constant series of practicing over and over what she should do. But she should be removed from the fun when, you know, she does something like that so that she learns that she doesn't get to have fun when she's engaging in, in behaviors that hurt other kids. So, uh, and I've talked to other parents that see a similar behavior in their children. And Sydney is obsessed with time and schedule and when are we doing what, yeah. what time, what time, what time is this, when are we doing that? And um, I mean, some of the stories are kind of funny, right? So, um, like, we've had people come over and she'll say, what time are you leaving? And they might say, oh, about 9 o'clock. And at 9 o'clock, she's like, ushering them out the door. Right. And she's just obsessed with staying on right. schedule. Is there anything we can do? And sometimes I feel like it's part of it is relieving anxiety that yes. she might be having. So are there thoughts on how to just reduce that a little bit? I don't think we're ever going to get away from it, but sometimes it just drives us nuts. Yeah. It's just nonstop asking about time. Yes, we're in the same boat. And, you know, I don't think you're alone here in this room. I would say the best thing might be, you know, I, I think you're right on about the anxiety that, you know, they just think over and over about like, well, when is this going to happen? When is that going to happen? So if it's possible to write out a schedule, you could do it day by day, or you could, if your schedule is pretty similar day to day, you can laminate it and put it with Velcro like up on the refrigerator on the wall and say like, okay, 8 o'clock is when we have breakfast, 8.30 the bus comes, 9 o'clock you're at school, and then when you come home, you know, we do snack, we do TV, we do dinner, and like have those kinds of things laid out for her. But she might also have a hard time, like right now, you're on vacation, everything's different. So she wants to know, like in her mind, how she can plan her day. And, you know, Petey was doing the same thing. It was like six o'clock and all of a sudden he was in my face this morning asking, like, what are we doing today? I'm like, well, I don't know what you're doing. I said, but I'm going to be in the workshops. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to go to wake daddy up and ask him what you're doing because I don't know. Um, I think for them it is about relieving anxiety, though. So the best you can do if you can say, well, we don't have an exact time, but sometime between one and two, you know, we're going to take you to see the, um, the museum over here today, and then we're going to have a dinner, and then we're going to do this. And the best you can give them an answer, but if she keeps asking you, I would say, remember, Sydney, we already went over this. What did I answer you? And say, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. And you have to stick with that, because if you don't give her that, like you say, did I answer that question? And she says, yes. What did I tell you? And have her repeat the answer. And, well, I think the best, yeah, the best thing would, would to tell her, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. And if she brings it up, just ignore her and, and you know, change the subject. And, you know, I, she might want to engage with you at that point. And that's the only thing in her mind that she can think to ask you. So she'll keep asking you the same thing. And you can just say, you know, hey, Sydney, um, did you have fun at the baseball game last night? And just, like, completely change the, the topic and talk about something else with her. And, Hopefully that will help, but that's what I remind Petey of the rule. Like, listen, I already answered that question. I'm not going to answer it anymore. We can talk about something else. And okay. yeah, good luck. Did you want to? <laughs> I was going to say that um, 
Tevin must have said, when are we coming here? Like, I can't even count that time. Yeah. But, uh, so what I finally started, and usually what we do is, I'll go through it with you first, and, and you kinda, I kind of have to get his attention first. We're going to do this, and then this, and this. But five minutes later, ten minutes later, he wants to hear it. He right. really wants to hear it. So I gave him these little tokens, a certain amount, as many as I can handle. Yeah. You know, so we came down to four. So four times that day. He can he ask you that question. But he had to bring me that token. He doesn't totally get it yet. Right. But the more you practice, the more he's going to get that, though. That's a great idea. He's still got the opportunity to say it, and I think he needs to. Yes. But you need to find a limit somewhere. Right. It has to be a balance. But I think that's a great idea because it's something that it's, it's not abstract. He has four tokens, and he realizes once these run out, I can't ask that question anymore. And as long as you're consistent and stick with that, he'll, he'll get it. But if you once in a while, like, I'll tell you one more time, then he's awesome. going to learn that he can push it. And you, know, you want to be consistent in that and say, listen, you had four tokens, and you used them up. We're not talking about it anymore. And that's a great suggestion, though. Thanks, Robin. So you're using ABA, and you didn't, didn't even know it. Know it. The unexpected. Yeah, to incorporate to teach your child. So you know, like if you have a, a, schedule, a schedule, you 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 may have a bit where you have a particular picture, which means you don't know what we're doing. Absolutely, and I would definitely encourage that because that's life, right? I mean, there are times when, you know, we had an appointment, we had to be somewhere, and we're driving, we hit traffic, that wasn't expected, and it's, you know, it's inconvenient, and it's annoying, and they have to learn that those things happen in, in real, the real world. So that is a good idea to kind of put, maybe it could have a question mark on it, or it could be just a picture of like white blank space if you're using photos to indicate you don't know what's going to happen during that period. And sometimes you could make it something fun, and sometimes you could make it something boring, and, you know, to switch it up to teach her, like, Sometimes we don't know. You know, we have to go with the flow and be flexible. And you know, that's hard for all of us. Change is hard, I think, no matter who you are. And for our kids, because they don't have the same level of communication, it's like ten times harder for them because maybe they can't ask you all the questions that they have, or they share the anxiety that they're feeling with you, or the worry that they might have about something. So the more information you can give them proactively, the better you're going to do. Because if they have that information, you know, like a written schedule is really very helpful, or like I said, a picture schedule to show them what they can expect from their day. And I see Amy nodding back there. I think she agrees with me that it's nice to have some some way to tell what's going to happen. And I think we all kind of like that. Like if if we had to show up at work and we didn't know what time we were allowed to leave, wouldn't you go mad? You know, if they were like, oh no, we'll let you know later. Don't worry about it. Like you know, we'll let you know. And and that would bring me to the same point about like rewarding good behavior. If you were expected to work and not get money, how often would you show up for work? Right? So you want to reward our kids for good behavior. And a lot of people say, well, they should behave just because I told them, because I'm the parent. And like, I get it. But that's not happening. So let's, let's go to plan B and reward them for good behavior. And eventually, you're going to fade it. It's not going to be like for the rest of their life. You're going to give them a skittle every time they, you know, pee on the toilet, or you know, you're eventually going to fade out. But initially, when you're teaching skills, it's really important to reinforce it so that they learn doing good things gets me good things, right? Because I'm not working if it's not not for a paycheck. That's for sure. Rebecca, did you have a question? Sorry, this has definitely increased with Elliot's language ability, so um, I, I often, if he's getting stuck, will sort of say, you're getting stuck, you know the answer to the question, you, what time is movie time? And he'll say, 5.30, and I'd say, so why'd you ask it? Yeah. And then, you know, I'd say, well, it seems like you're having big feelings about that. Yeah. And are you excited? Are you looking forward to it? Do you want to tell me something about movie time? Do you have plans for it? And try to use that kind of repetition as a way to get him to verbalize a little bit. That's a great idea. Why he keeps saying, what time is movie time? What time is movie time? What time is movie time? That's a great, because you're giving him the feelings. You're, you're talking about, okay, I could see that you're feeling this way. And so 
here you go. And I, I'll do the same thing with Petey. Like, you're having a hard time shutting your brain off, aren't you? And he'll say, yes. Like, that's it. Like, it's running through his brain, and he cannot shut off that we're going to the movies at 5.30. And that's perfect to give him, like, another thing to talk about, you know, or, or something related to that topic, but not asking that question over and over. Yeah, and then I find, like, it may not happen that time, but maybe the next time I'll say, is there something else you want to say? And I'll say, I'm looking forward to movie time. And then I can start a conversation, because then I can say, oh, what do you want to pick today as right. your TV show? And so instead of it just being about what time is it over and over again, then we're actually talking about exactly. something you like. So. That's perfect. Those are the introverbals. Yeah, and the coolest thing that came from that is we got him to talk about, he always said, I'm nervous about this, I'm nervous, 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 and a few times recently we've gotten him to say, I'm excited, like the nervous has turned into excited. That's great. You, are you afraid or are you just... You right, what kind of it? nervous? The distinction of like, there's a version of, it's not nervous, it's actually excited. Right, but it can kind of feel the same way. Yeah, yeah. So and it's hard to distinguish. To the difference and it's just through lots of repetition and fun. Yeah, and that's amazing. But that's it, if you can identify their emotions and help them identify their emotions, either with picture cards, with signs, or words. I mean, this is not limited to verbal language. You can definitely um, have a picture card. Like you can, I would recommend, rather than using something from the computer, using pictures of your child's face. So if you see them crying, quickly snap a picture, and that's the picture when they're sad. And if you see them like, ah, making that face, you snap a picture, that's when they're angry, and you show that to them. Are you angry right now? You're feeling angry. Okay, show this to mommy, and you have them pick up that card and hand it to you to show, I'm angry right now. And it's, it's, it's too abstract, I think, often to use the photos that come along, the drawings, rather, with pecs. It's, it's much more um, relatable to them, I think, if you have a picture of a human face showing an emotion. I think that really means more to them. But again, there are signs for all of these as well. You can do signs, you can, if they have the words, and you always want to pair the word with the picture or the signs so they're hearing it. But you want to label those emotions because how frustrating. If you were feeling anxious about something and you couldn't get that out, can you imagine how awful? On top of the anxiety that you can't tell someone how you're feeling, five minutes, okay, five minutes, folks. Any other questions? Oh, okay. There's a, there's a live stream question? Okay. Oh, okay, one more question. Okay, and I'll be here so you can talk to me if. We use social stories. Mm -hmm. Lots of social stories. Social stories are great. We make before our, our active Brandon is very visual, so I was on a trip and I took a picture of taking off of the airplane, a video, and yeah. landing on the airplane, you know, down the airplane. That's a great idea set it all up so he could look at all the pictures in preparation. Now what we do when we get back is not only is our our board, mm -hmm. example, we're gonna go in this room, probably go to school and everywhere else it goes. Yeah. Broke, but For a while. We will make a book and we'll laminate it. That's a great so idea. That can relive this as long as he wants to. Thank you for bringing that up. It, it's just 45 minutes is such a short time to talk about like everything, but um, Craig and Rebecca have a book over here that they made for Elliot that um, I, they put up so I think you can look through if you want. Social stories are great ways to teach your children different things about like an upcoming trip, about you know um, an activity they're gonna do, about going to the bathroom and learning how to use the toilet. And you know, like we have a book at home that Elmo uses the toilet, but it would be even better if I had one of my children using the toilet because that's really real to them. And social stories are such a great way because our kids are often visual learners, so the language becomes like wah, 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 wah in their heads. But if you can show them pictures, they're going to understand that better. And again, you can make it fun. You're reading it at bedtime and you know before the activity and going over it and over it. And that's a great way to teach them. So our time is up. Thank you so much for your attention. And um, like I said, I'll be here if you have any questions. <laughs>